Okay, hello everyone and welcome to New York Wine and Grape Foundation's New York State of Wine. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. Diverse and bold with a long history stretching back hundreds of years, New York is reinventing itself as an epicenter of dynamic winemaking. The state is home to the first winery in the United States and producers are drawing on that background to produce some of the most exciting wines in the country. In this sixth episode of the series, we bring our focus to the topic of sustainability in New York State. Before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants. Uh, we have a chat section and a Q&A section. So the chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Uh, just be sure to select all panelists and attendees uh, in the to field as it can default to panelists only. The Q&A section is the important one. That's where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered uh, towards the end of the webinar. Now to introduce our speakers. Our moderator for today's webinar is Pascaline Le Peltier from the Loire Valley, a former philosophy teacher. Pascaline is a sommelier based in Manhattan, New York. She's worked in Michelin star restaurants in France and New York City, where her beverage program earned best wine list in the world by the world of fine wine. In 2018, she joined as a partner uh, at Racine's New York, where the focus of the list is wines made from respectful farming. She passed the master sommelier exam in 2014 was the first woman to win the best French sommelier com competition in 2018 and is a MOF, Meilleur of Ouvrier de France, in sommellerie. She also educates about wine, speaks regularly, and writes a monthly column for La Revue du Vin de France, and is preparing her first solo book to be published in 2022. Finally, she makes a little bit of natural wine uh, from the organic historical hybrids with her partner, Nathan Kendall in the Finger Lakes under the label Shepika. Joining Pascaline R, Roman Roth of Wolfer Estate in the Long Island ABA of New York. Roman began a three-year apprenticeship at the Kaiserstuhl Wine Cooperative, Aber Rottweil, while attending technical school as a teenager. Following that, he traveled to the U.S., working at the Saintsbury Estate in California, then to New South Wales, Australia at Rosemount Estate. Returning to Germany, he became a winemaker at Winzerkeller Wieslock near Heidelberg and earned his master winemaker and cellar master degree from the College of Enology and Viticulture in Weinsberg. In 1992, Roman became the first winemaker at Wolfer Estate Vineyard and in 2003, he was named Winemaker of the Year, the East End Food and Wine Awards, judged by the American Sommelier Society. Josh Wig of Lamoureux Landing in the Finger Lakes. Josh grew up on a multi-generational fruit and vegetable farm in Northwestern Pennsylvania and earned his undergraduate degree in biology. He then joined the US Submarine Force as Naval Officer and then Naval Nuclear Engineer. Josh married into the family in 2003 and then joined the winery team in 2007. He has been a partner since 2010. Oscar Bink of Herman J. Wiemer Vineyard in New Finger Lakes. Since 2007, Oscar and his business partner, winemaker Fred Merwath, have managed the 90 acre property with a commitment to viticulture through leadership and experimentation and is widely considered to be the standard bearer at the helm of the Finger Lakes Revolution. Before going to Wiemer, Oscar, a Swedish agronomist who holds a Master of Science in Agriculture Economics and studied at Cornell University, worked in the wine business with distributors of Diageo and Moet and Hennessy in New York City. So before we hand it over to Pascaline and the panel, I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Sam Filler, He's the executive director of New York Wine and Grape Foundation, and will give a brief intro with the background about the organization's new sustainability program set to roll out this year. So now let's get started. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Katie. And happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, I thought it would be good for me to join today, given the topic of sustainability 
And um, in our previous uh, iterations of New York State of Mind, uh, questions often come up about what the state is doing about sustainability, what individual wineries are doing. And, um, you know, I thought it would be valuable for me to share an update on that. And uh, we have some exciting progress that we're making on that front. Um, but this is not something new to the New York State wine industry. 20 years ago, a self-assessment tool called Vine Balance was developed by uh, Cornell University and a group of growers. And that then became um, Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing, which was uh, further developed into a certification program specifically for Long Island. And I think Roman will talk a little bit more about that. And uh, that program has been in effect for over five years. And that remains the only certification program that exists in New York State. So we were uh, successful in securing some grant funding so we can begin a pilot project for a statewide program. Uh, we'll be launching that later this spring uh, and with the hopes of working with a group of 25 growers to help them uh, revisit the Vine Balance self-certification program our self-assessment guide, and then actually transform that into an official certification in 2022. Uh, we know that this is important, especially for the European market, as more and more consumers are uh, investigating the provenance of their wines and looking for responsible farming practices. And, you know, these are things that are happening in New York State, and we just need a way to kind of recognize and, and honor those and also push the envelope forward in terms of best practices here in New York. Um, we're also participating on a joint grant with the California Sustain Sustainable Wine Growing Association. Uh, they're hosting a multi-state uh, initiative to promote sustainability in the U.S. wine industry. They held their first uh, summit in 2019 in Sonoma. We were going to be hosting it last year in Long Island in Riverhead, and it, you know, because of COVID, we were going to postpone to this year, but it's now going to be virtual. Uh, if you go to CSWA.org, you can find more information there. It's going to be April 19th through the 21st. Uh, we're excited to be part of this commitment because this is a you know, really important area for the wine industry to lead in in terms of how we're being good stewards for our environment and you know, being a response to climate change in the world. So uh, I think you're going to hear a lot more exciting things that are happening across New York from Oscar, Josh, and Roman. And um, you know, thank you for participating today. Thanks for all of you to be here with us today. And thanks to Josh, Roman, and Oscar for um, joining me for, I think, a very important conversation about what's happening today in New York and how it's very, very exciting. Uh, just, just to repeat a little uh, uh, organization question, we will take questions, but probably more at the end, uh, just because some of the facts, data, perspective may uh, be shared between the different uh, uh, winemakers, so we will do uh, really at the end a Q&A. So please just send everything and we'll try to uh, condense and synthesize the question to make sure we can answer as much as possible uh, at the very end. So uh, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about the question of sustainability in New York because it's been dear to my heart since I arrived uh, in the States uh, in 2009. And uh, at the time I was working for the restaurant for whose sustainability and uh, was a, a key point of the, of the concept for food and for wine, as well as working uh, closely with um, short circuit in terms of production. So I got uh, very lucky to discover and spend quite some time in New York over the years uh, and to see uh, a, a kind of pretty exceptional um, evolution and dynamism in terms of the question of sustainability. I wouldn't say it's easy for a region like New York to go that path. Um, just why, despite the fact that New York is boasting some of one of the oldest history of, of winemaking uh, in the country in North America, and that there is a presence of, of vines uh, here since uh, millions of years, um, certain form of vitis, um, that proves that this part of the world is very well suited for wine growing, or at least vitis growing, um, New York is a very, very specific part of the world in terms of the, the challenges uh, to make wine. What do I mean by here is like, uh, it's not the Mediterranean. It's not like everything is super easy and you, don't, you are not dealing with quite uh, intense uh, 
plus and minus, or what, what can I say, challenges that become opportunities for New York State. Uh, one of the big ones is um, the, the fact that, let me, we can put the map up, if you don't mind, Katie. The fact that the state is uh, really uh, located in a part of the world when you have major influence of uh, of a couple of uh, factors that make wine growing, um, I would say, um, yeah, not as easy. Some of them, of course, is all the climatic things that we are seeing in New York, um, where um, allowing this region to have a, a fantastic, very, very long growing season uh, that allows, as we all know, the longer the growing season, the probably the, 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 the better potential development for a large amount of, of grape variety with the highest potential of expression is possible. But also with um, the challenges of having critical winter, cold winter, as well as quite important uh, rain, um, rain events, especially in critical time like flowering and, uh, and harvest. So what I admire in New York is despite all these kind of critical challenges, there will be right away since I arrived uh, a big emphasis of understanding that they had in a very specific part uh, of the world that within two generations managed to become, I think, a world leading wine region for cool climate grape. Um, and I think that is partially due to the fact that there is this emphasis uh, on how to farm better and how to farm appropriately to our land and the land in, uh, in New York um, with the idea of making world-class wine. Um, and I, can't, I cannot think that this, the speed that within two generations now, you can talk about New York State and people all over the world know that there is world-class wine made here is not directly linked to a certain idea of farming and that has been led by free, I think today, uh, winemakers are gonna be able to, to develop their different strategy. So what do, we, what do we talk about when we are talking about sustainability? We all know that it's a very, very trendy marketing world today uh, that can mean a lot of things, uh, but it comes down at the end to I think a couple of very specific principles that people have different strategy to apply to different levels. Uh, and seeing, um, seeing a development like taken on by the by the whole state like we're seeing today is not what we're seeing in every one region in the world. So I think we need to underline that there is an individual strategy and effort that is done, but there is also a global strategy that is put in place today. And you don't see that everywhere in the world. Uh, so how does it work? How has it been put together? Uh, I think this is a perspective we're we are going to talk about with, with Josh, Roman, and Oscar. But um, just a couple of like the, the three main points of, I would say we will agree on sustainability is the idea of, of conserving what we have, knowing that great wines are thanked to be um, uh, because of a, of, a, of a terroir that has been preserved over the years that needs to be able to be conserved. Uh, and meaning conserving the resources, the biodiversity, the water and the land. That's the first part, is how to grow while reducing our impacts. The second part, how today can we steward what have been given before? and how to do it in a way that there is a future for it. How do we think about today, but how do we think about tomorrow or the next decade and the next generation and the next generation? Because wine growing is a long, long, long dynamic. And this uh, free part of, of course, touching free major, uh, free major field environment, um, the environment, what we're going to talk about. And of course, yeah, there is different strategy to work with it, sustainable, but organic, biodynamic farming and also. There is a social aspect that is something more and more critical, especially today in the state. It's a very, very important question. How do we care for our staff, for our team of people working with us, but also the consumer? And also it doesn't make any sense if this is not viable. It needs to be here for the long run and the economy part needs also to be taken in consideration in the sustainable side. So this is a little bit the different aspect we're gonna talk about with three different stories, three different, uh, um, strategy, but at the, same, at the same time, I think three different dynamics that are getting together today to make New York a very, very powerful uh, one region to talk about sustainability. So we are going to start uh, with, uh, with you, Roman, um, and we are going to go down to, uh, to Long Island. Um, so there is, as you can see, 
different uh, wandering area uh, in, in New York. Uh, and today we wanted to focus on Long Island and on the Finger Lakes, knowing that there is a lot of things happening also in the, on the Hudson and on Lake Erie and a little bit more in Chandler. Uh, but really due to the history of the region, this is really the two areas where we can see really the work of what sustainable mean and uh, which level of, of quality and result um, over the years has been possible to be done. So we are gonna go down to the North Fork of, uh, sorry, to the Hamptons, sorry, to Long Island. Uh, not very far from New York City, uh, roughly, I think, uh, from where I am right now in, in Harlem to Wolfer is when there is no traffic is three hours. So it's not very, very far. It's a backyard of New York City. And uh, Roman, uh, we are going to start with you. Uh, and if you can maybe introduce us a little bit, uh, Long Island, the Hamptons uh, and your history. Well, thank you very much all for listening. I put on my best Long Island accent for you. <laughs> Well, New York, when you looked at the size, it certainly, in, if it would be in Europe, it would be a country. So we're very proud of New York State. And there is a big diversity because of the size. It's the same way, you know, in the south of Italy or the north of Italy, very different styles of wine. And so is true for, long, for New York. So Long Island and the Finger Lakes are certainly very different. Um, we are yeah, 100 miles, 160 kilometers from Manhattan. It's a great area to grow grapes. Um, I go quickly about Long Island and then about our sustainability program. So, yeah, there's around 3,000 acres of vines on Long Island, around 50, something 52 vineries. Some of them are quite small. Uh, you can leave actually the, the grape, the, the vine, the, the picture one more time. We're, Long Island is basically a maritime. We're an island, Long Island. You can see there is the South, the Atlantic on the South. You see all the water masses right between the North Fork and the South Fork is called the Bay, where is the, a big water body. And then on the North, you have the Sound, which is between Connecticut and Long Island. So there is an amazing water influence that basically warms up the air in winter when the cool sea air breezes come down from Canada, they have to go over this water mass and it certainly softens the blow. And as a result, we have no winter damage on Long Island, which is a, a great part, which is certainly unique. We can prune very aggressively in January and decide, do we want to make our $100 bottle of wine or do we want to make our $26 bottle of wine? Already at pruning, we, just, we choose that. Um, so the sea breeze, basically, with our vineyards are 2.6 miles or four kilometers from the ocean, from the Atlantic. So a beautiful spot where you get this natural sea breeze. And this sea breeze, we capture this sea breeze. And it basically makes, I think, some of the most food-friendly wines in America. You know, same is true with the Finger Lakes. They have there. I think that's the, one of the greatest strengths of, of New York State wines, how food-friendly these wines are. Um, again, I mentioned no winter damage. Then we are very blessed. We have no spring frosts because we have a very late frost. Uh, in the time spring or when it gets warmer, the, the ocean is a bit cooler by that stage. So it takes, there's a very short spring time and that pre prevents us from having any spring frost dangers. And in summer, it's basically the cool, cool nights because of the uh, uh, ocean influence, but we have warm days. And why do we have warm days? Because we are on the same latitude as Madrid, uh, Naples or uh, Madrid in Spain or Naples in Italy on the four is the 40th, 40.93 north uh, on the latitude. So it's a fantastic influence of sun and the sea breeze makes us a very unique combination. Um, on the Winkler index, basically, where you have the growing degree days and where you have the different wine regions prescribed. Um, let's say the last 10 years, our average growing degree days is, is 3,206 or in Celsius, uh, 1,762. Um, region number two is basically Yara Valley, Alsace, Bordeaux, Napa for between 1391 to 1670. Or region number three is like Rioja, Piemont, Clare Valley, Barossa Valley between 1671 and 1950. So basically we fall exactly in the middle of region two and three. Um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, actually, it was a little bit cooler. We were more at like at, at 3,090 and 1697 in Celsius. So we were a little bit closer to region two, but still nevertheless in the middle of the two. Um, and I think that's quite a unique setup. 
uh, where, where we make up. This is for Long Island specifically. Uh, the soil is excellent. We have a Bridgehampton loam and a Haven loam, which has a great, because Long Island was formed by a glacier 10,000 years ago. So we have great water holding capacity. We have great nutrition in the soil, but we have also excellent drainage. And I think that's another you know, uh, important part to when you want to make quality wines. We can only compete with quality, not with quantity. We can't compete with Central Valley in California or with wines from Australia when quantity wise, but quality wise, we certainly can compete. Um, so that's the great soil. We have a lovely rolling hills. I don't know if there's another picture of our vineyards, um, which help if there are rains in the fall, helps with shedding off the water. And so that we can get concentration at the end of the season. Uh, another important part for Long Island is our clientele, part of the terroir. We have amazing customers with the New York, 100 miles away. The Hamptons, the East End is a huge vacation destination for New Yorkers and for trendsetters and for people. And that has been, a, you know, it helps again to get the message out and to, to you know, where people experience our wines firsthand. And we don't have to rely on advertising and, and other things. So it goes direct word of mouth. Uh, we do sell our wines in 30 states now. We into seven countries, Sweden, Denmark, England, Germany, a couple of countries in Germany, uh, in Europe. And we make around 127,000 cases now, Wolf for a state. So it has certainly a um, lot of rosé, lots of quality, different wines. Um, and we can go to the next picture, which will be going more into our sustainable growing. We're very proud that Long Island was is the first recognized area east of the Rocky Mountains, which has a self-certified, uh, independently certified uh, program where we have worked basically sort of simulating in some ways the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance or the LIFE, which is from Oregon, the, the low input viticulture and enology. But it has to be something that works for you. It has to be, it has, you have to be truthful to your terroir, to your climate. Otherwise, you will never succeed and you will always, you know, try to push something up, up a hill that will never work. So we have Cornell University, which is a fantastic, you know, uh, resource in our great research extension here in Riverhead on Long Island. And between that and our own participation of many different wineries, we have come up with our own program. And it has really been a, a, a huge boost for everybody to push forward. Uh, one of the things why you don't see many organic or biodynamic vineyards on Long Island, or maybe for, for that matter in New York, is because nobody has to prove in France or in Germany that you can make great wine. But when you make in, Long, in New York or Long Island a, a wine, and there would be a little bit of an earthy note because you uh, you had a little bit of an issue. Oh, I told you Long Island can't grow grapes. So we we're facing that prejudice. And while that prejudice is still existing in some way, in some way uh, I think sustainability, sustainable wine growing is the best way to approach and to tackle that prejudice and show with quality and show with consistency that we make great wines that have there's three things that I look mainly. One is to be authentic to our own climate, to our region. One is to make wines that are the most food friendly wines possible and that is very suitable for our climate and the last goal is to make wines with longevity and we have a we're tasting a red wine our merlot this wine can age 30 to 40 years um, now my oldest vintage so far is the 2021 for this particular wine but we have from wolfer estate wines that go back to 94 93 that are aging beautifully so those are the three goals um yeah so we're the stewards of the land we live right here in the vineyard and you know, many there's many ways of basically that what that makes our sustainable a success. And one is biodiversity that we have really a meadows that we have hedgerows that we leave between the row coverage that we have ponds uh, is an important part that we have this you know that we don't try to farm a monoculture for example uh, uh, we try to be more tolerant. That's another big important part. When there is now when we have a mite pests or something. You don't just spray the whole vineyard like in the past, like 20, 30 years ago. You, you know, ideally you wait and you don't have to spray it all because your vines and your your whole plants and everything are in balance. Uh, and if you do finally, even if you would have to spray an insecticide, you would only target a tiny spot where the hot spot is of your vineyard. So uh, that's an important part. That's why I don't think you will see ever 
2,000 acre vineyards, you will only see 100 acre vineyards, 50 acre vineyards, smaller lots, which are manageable, which can be observed, which can be basically monitored with the footsteps of the wine maker or the wine of the vineyard manager. Um, so on, on that note, Roman, can you maybe just give us a little bit of an idea of, of, of where you're located? Because you are in between other growers that are not necessarily viticulture. That are not, so there is, a, there is a Long Island is a, a farm, it's a farming area, as well as now, as you said, tourist area where there is a lot of people living and surrounding the vineyard. So there is an evolution in terms of that landscape. Um, and can you can you talk a little bit about that? And can you talk about what you implemented over the year and what is the dynamic exactly of what was done 10, 15 years ago? You just touched on it. Where are you at right now uh, for Wolfer, but also as this uh, network of other estates with the help, which I think is also very important. There is research that are helping you. There is, there is, you have, you have the ability to talk with scientists, you have the ability to really learn exchange and, and move on. And it's not just about getting sustainable today, it's about continue to build that program to keep on bringing as many people possible, but then to go to the next level, right? Can yes. you touch on that? I mean, you know, for example, you know, nowadays, we only, if we even fertilize, we use only organic fertilizers. We have a tunnel sprayer and I would, I, I am insisting that it should be mandatory. Right now, it's not yet mandatory that every winery who is part of this sustainable program on Long Island has a tunnel sprayer. To me, it's such a big advantage when you recapture 50% of your spray material at the early beginning of the season, for example. Um, so I'm a bit stricter with that way. We do have a tunnel sprayer and I am maybe... 70% of the wine growers that are part of this organization have tunnel sprayers, but there's still some air blasters out there as well. Um, yeah, now we really try hard to not use herbicides. We, we you know, do under the ground mulch, between the row mulching. Uh, there are some years when you have very lot of spring rains or early summer rains where it is a difficult thing where you may have to still use a, a, a contact herbicides, but you would never use, you're not allowed to use a pre-emergent herbicide, for example. Um, so that's those are the couple of the things. I mean, there's over a program of over 200 things and the point rating system that we do. You know, we still use a basically a systemic fungicide once a year, but um, that's better than tons of copper and tons of sulfur probably. So as I said, at this stage, why we not we can't go further than this because we're still building the reputation of New York wines and Long Island wines. I think this is the the the, the most so the most sustainable uh, approach right now to wine growing. Um, there's a lot of you know cooperation. We have monthly meetings. Uh, certainly, all the growers. It's a small industry with only 50 wineries or 52 wineries and 3,000 acres. So everybody knows everybody. So people do work together very closely and help each other out. I think that's the the key. And you, basically, you you imitate, you mimic the successful growers. We are very fortunate. We have one of the best wine vineyard managers on Long Island, and that certainly is, you know, makes my life easier as a winemaker. But he also is very, you know, consults and calls and talks to a lot of people, what should be the best approach. The, basically, one of the biggest things that I would also do, and if you, I don't know if you can show the vineyard picture again, is this complete approach to manual input in our vineyards. We are very fortunate that we can afford to have these absolutely, and that's the biggest strength of our of our wine make, of our vineyard manager. Have the balance of the vines that you don't have this vigorous bush that creates shade that we don't have that we have to hedge all the time. So we keep this really neat canopy so you don't trap extra moisture. The bottom line is you try to keep your disease pressure as low as possible. And when you see our vineyards, they are immaculate. They, I mean, you could draw paintings how beautiful our vineyards look and how homogeneous the ripening is, that all leads basically to, ultimately to longevity. And the most important is every vineyard looks nice where the tasting room is or where the owner of the winery lives, but you can go in the last corner of our estate where every vine is treated the same. And for our top wines, where no cluster would touch each other, where we do very aggressive thinning of shoot thinning, cluster thinning, leaf removing, you can see this picture, how every cluster is exposed to sunlight there's many different advantages. Again, as soon as sunlight comes up, the sun hits the grapes, they dry quicker from dew. 
again, because we have maritime climate, humidity can be our little enemy. The biggest enemy would be a hurricane, of course, but knock on wood, since 1991 was the last time we had a direct hit uh, during the growing season, so we haven't, we've been very fortunate. But we do all this extra work so that we have absolute perfect conditions and low disease pressure, which then ultimately means you don't develop uh, resistance against fungus disease, fungus against uh, fungicides, for example. It all adds up. Everything adds up over the years. If you if you have a bad management out in the vineyard, you know all of a sudden you you it's very difficult to control your vineyard. Uh, and that's I think one of the things that I mean lots of people do. And timing is everything. You know when do you drop your fruit? When do you do your leaf removing? You don't just do it two weeks before the harvest so that you can tell the owner, oh she we only got two tons an acre. You you do it when is the perfect moment? I call them the crossroads. And so. That's, I think, uh, it, may, it takes much more individual skill and individual attention to detail and staff and more money. And that's what makes a great, great wine, basically. And that, you know, not anything good can't be easy, I always say. So this is one of the things. So uh, I guess my time is up. So we're going to the wine now. So anyway, it's, this, it's tremendous amount of detail in every positioning of shoot, every cluster counts, every grape when we pick. We flick out rotten berries, we fanatic how clean we pick our grapes. And all that leads to longevity of our wines and of intensity. And as a result, you can let the grapes hang a long time. We're the last area also in New York State to get a frost. So if you have healthy leaves and healthy canopies, you can reap the benefits of those last October days or even sometimes into November where we ripen and have photosynthesis of our, you know, and ripening of our grapes to make more, in, more interesting, more concentrated vines. As I mentioned, we fall between rain, grape growing region two and three, but this is what makes Long Island so unique. We have intensity and power in the way we grow our grapes, but we also have this cool elegance. And so we don't make cough syrup reds. We'd have elegant balanced red wines. Uh, and we can go into this. Um, obviously there's a lot of rosé made on Long Island. We make a lot of rosé, there's fantastic whites. It's almost a mixed blessing that we can do many different grape varieties very well. Um, as a result, if you think of Oregon, you think of Pinot Noir, if you think of the Finger Lakes, you think of Riesling. You know, if you think of Long Island, I'm pushing Merlot, but there's a lot of different grape varieties, varieties that do very well. Cabernet Franc is doing very well, and especially the last seven, ten years when we've gotten warmer and warmer during the summer months or during the whole year, basically. And we certainly pushed ripening to another level. Um, so this I is, think, yeah, I, I, I think it's a very good point to say there is still a diversity of grapes grown there and certain grape varieties that are not that easy to grow well, um, and not, uh, for the, for the quality to get, to achieve the perfect ripeness, especially the ripeness of the skin, not to get this kind of green aromatics, but to get this perfect balance. That's, it's also linked to the way you are farming, not, not oh, over abusing okay. to certain products. So this is where you can really get that, that profile that you are looking for. And the biggest change over the last 25 years is when you saw the picture of how perfectly we expose our grape clusters to the sun. And we do this right mm -hmm. after flowering, exactly after flowering, so that the clusters get ex exposed to the sun. It's like your skin. If you're just going out in the middle of August to the beach, you get sunburned. So yeah, if absolutely. you lose your leaves early, your grapes early, you don't get sunburned. And secondly, it helps to reduce the pyrazines, all those grassy green flavors. Mm -hmm. Our red wines since then have become extremely rich and they show fruit and not just uh, those pyrazines that in the early 25 years ago would, would be more, you know, what people tasted more. Um, no, I, I, th I think this is a big thing that I saw uh, from the evolution of, at least on the aromatics and the, and the way that the red are behaving over the last 13 years, me being here, is they're definitely moving from a very strong varietal, almost vegetal characteristic to something way more, more integrated, balanced, ripe without losing the freshness which I think we are going to see that a little bit in, in the finger legs. Um, we'll have more questions, especially like what I want to take from you, you is also to say there is a human factor of investing and making sure you are able also to sell your one at a certain price point and you have this ability to then invest in all this detail, including equipment, uh, your staff, that a large team that uh, you work with a, in, in, with a lot of respect too. So I think this is a very key factor to understand the economical balance. But um, 
Let's thanks a lot, Roman, um, for this perspective on on on, long, on the Long Island and, and the Hamptons specifically. And now we are going to go to to the Finger Lakes, uh, and where we are going to have two different uh, perspectives, just because two different sides of the lake. So we are going to go to Seneca Lake, uh, and we are going to start with uh, with Oscar uh, from uh, Herman Herman Wimmer, which probably is well known by most of you as one of the pioneering winery um, in, in the area. And also somebody that is really taking a large risk in terms of sustainability today, at least on the uh, farming side, because uh, moving towards the biodynamic practices in an area where it's, it's not easy. So Oscar, can you briefly talk about your side of the lake? Because just before Josh talk about the other side, what makes it unique and a little bit the history and makes uh, your, your, yeah. your approach to sustainability. All right, thanks for having me here. And uh, as you hear, another New York accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this true New Yorker is coming, represent New York here, it's great. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm from Herman Weimer then, which is uh, now, so where Roman was, was down, in, uh, down on the island, you have to almost travel five, six hours then northeast to come to, uh, to the Finger Lakes. And uh, now you're almost towards the Canadian border. Uh, in the north here. Uh, so the lakes, just some fundamentals about Finger Lakes. You're traveling north, it's going to be getting a little cooler. And we often say that you are on now the, the edge of what is possible to, to grow, especially on vinifera. Um, there's a long history here, with, which Pascaline mentioned, with growing hybrids and number other other. Uh, native varieties. Uh, and then in the 60s and 70s, uh, there were a few pioneers here in the area started to flirt with the idea of planting viniferous. And then Herman Weimer was one of them, uh, coming from Mosul and Berncastle in Mosul. Uh, other you might have heard Dr. Frank and Charles Fournier, who worked with uh, uh, Veuve Clicquot and so forth. So this, uh, again, in the 60s, 70s, we started to figure out how to grow vinifera. And the main reason why we can grow vinifera or we have vinifera can survive the winters are these lakes. So Seneca Lake, which is the main lake in the middle, is uh, over 200 meters deep. So no matter how cold it gets in the winter, uh, it won't freeze. Uh, and then because of the, the mass of water, the, it will have a rather constant temperature. Therefore, back to the moderating effects of the oceans in Long Island, you have a, not similar, but you also have moderating effects from the lake. Um, so a lake will stay cold in the summer and the lake will stay relatively warm in the winter. So you will see uh, the wineries be planting vineyards around the edge of the lake and then, then the agricultural viability of each site derives heavily on the relationship with the lake. So when we talk about where we place vineyards, what we plant, it's also always about the conversation about is how close it is to the lake. So you know, taking care of the, take advantage of the airflow, air drainage, and then going back to the disease pressures and so forth. Uh, so that's the main factor. Also, we saw the big lake up north there, the Lake Ontario, the Great Lakes, also has a big effect on weather patterns and weather movements and so forth. So the lakes, that's, it's key when it comes to that. The other aspects of our terroir is obviously our soils. Uh, these are glacier soils. So uh, there's a mosaic of soils, everything from gravel, to uh, clay and, and uh, there's uh, some lime soils, uh, again, derivatives from when glaciers receded back during uh, about 10,000 years ago. So back, so the lakes and the soils makes it a rather specific mesoclimate here. So uh, being so cold in the winter, we can only really grow varieties that can handle the cold winter. Those vines such as Riesling, Cap Franc, Chardonnay, uh, Pinot also in, in Gewürztraminer will be some of the more common varieties here. Generally varieties that are cold hardy, the wood is actually a little thicker and also late budding because of, again, we do have the danger of spring frost here. Um, 
as we're traveling a little bit more inland uh, than Long Island, we have a little more intenser summer, more of a little bit more inland climate than you will have on the ocean. But also rather known for long dragged out beautiful falls here. So the vintage in the Finger Lakes really get defined between September and October, where uh, we have a fairly long time for to pick all the, the, the fruit. So um, then a little bit of history of the winery. Herman Weimer himself is, is considered to be one of the pioneers how to figure out how to grow vinifera here. And uh, we are, again, um, I don't, maybe someone know who Herman Weimer is, but his father was rather known for having, uh, being the in charge of the agriculture experimental station in Berncastle in Mosul. So grafting is actually what Herman specialized in. So when he came here, he did not only see or ex what kind of wine, vines so he can make wines, but also he was very much into the grafting. So we today, Herman Weimer, have a big nursery uh, where we propagate vines uh, to uh, many other wineries uh, around the country and uh, therefore have helped many other wineries and, and can maybe represent thought leadership when it comes to then agriculture. So with that in mind, uh, we have always kind of have a history or tradition toward innovation and, and uh, experiment because that's, we had to do that to figure things out here. Um, so today we are uh, uh, we working with organic farming. We now have 40 acres of biodynamic farming. And yes, Pascal, you mentioned it's difficult and Roman, you mentioned also. Um, we are about five years into biodynamic farming. Um, we feel that it's actually working. Um, rather well, uh, mainly because you spend a little bit more time in the vineyards. You, uh, you have, uh, there are some challenges, again, back, back to moisture. Uh, we've had some hits, but uh, ultimately with both uh, global warming and erratic weather, you tend to need to work a little bit more of being uh, preemptive in your methods, so building up resilience and, uh, and resistance in the vine more than being reactive has been something that we have worked towards and it seemed to be, seemed to be working. Um, but again, knock on wood, we're five years into it. Um, uh, there's a screen here that popped up um, a little bit on our methods. Um, so we have having a nursery uh, means that we can hire staff all year round. So we have staff that's been working for us, that same staff that grafts in the winter also prunes and helps us harvest uh, in the fall. So all our fruit is uh, hand harvest here on this date and they were also sorted. And with that in mind, we're able to have a very um, detailed approach to picking so the wine, for example, that we are representing here today is the dry Riesling that has been picked over almost uh, eight weeks, different pickings, different sections. You go in and capture acidity early in cooler sites, uh, shallow sites, I say shallow site when you have less uh, uh, vigor in the soils, for example, you have more presence of the bedrock. You have, uh, late picked with higher sugar levels, or more potential alcohol, and you blend it. So we pick in, so it's, a, it's our, our harvest schedule is a rather complex one. And we capture all these nuances and keep them in different tanks and then we blend. And uh, we then do not, uh, with that in mind, we feel that our must gets rather uh, clean, if you put it that way, so we can, uh, rely on indigenous yeast along our fermentations and we don't find or filtering our wines. Um, again, it's a process that we've gradually gone into over the years uh, here at Weimar. Um, we've noticed if you go back in time, uh, let's see here, I think Herman stopped using herbicides in two, 15 years ago, maybe 17 years ago. Um, and then also as Roman is saying, all of us uh, have kind of gone towards being very, very sensitive and uh, uh, 
not so heavy handed in the vineyards anymore. Um, and uh, all our sprays are organic, but we've even seen that the health of the of uh, yeast culture and so forth is healthier. So we can rely on that more and more over the years. So again, the activity that we have done in the vineyards have also helped us made more reliable, higher quality wines. So, uh, and you see also here we are using cover crop quite a lot. Uh, one of the problems we have obviously is with moisture, you tend to have uh, you drive tractor, you have compaction issues and so forth. So uh, cover crop, uh, what you see on the picture there is, um, I believe it's bursine clover, but we even use radishes and things like that also. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of emphasis on the health of the vineyards. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, what Oscar, else? Sorry, sorry, Oscar. Oh, how did you put together the, the team to do so? Because it's uh, you have a, the, the size of the estate is pretty consequent. Now you are also have a, a new property over the year. So how have you been putting together the team? Because it's a, a mix of talents, commitment, vision. Um, what about that part on, on that? And then the second question will be when we're going to talk about the wine is, what are the reaction of the consumer to what you are doing? Um, so we've gradually grown into this. I mean, um, Fred and, and even Herman and myself, uh, he, he was uh, pretty committed to uh, not use, um, uh, again, much chemicals in the vineyards, but he was by himself. So when he retired uh, 15 years ago, before that, he just didn't have enough resources to put in place what he wanted. So Fred and I, when we took over 15 years ago, we took that as a priority, but we also had seen that the wines, the wine quality uh, was elevated. Um, we then hired um, Tace from, uh, he's from Holland, but he's really worked in Loire Valley and he's been working, uh, worked with the biodynamic program in Loire. He is now spearheading uh, all these initiatives in the vineyards. And then we've hired a few other uh, Cornell grads who are working with us towards to, to move things forward in the sustainable um, division, if you put it that way. Um, the other thing going back, we committed to our team that works in our nursery. So we have a community that have worked and lived with us here for 10 years. Um, then also, again, in order to create a place for people that can work and also educate people when they're here, because that it's been a lot of, a lot of work to make this happen, a lot of hand labor in order to make this work. Um, you asked about pricing today or, or how people react to what we do. We yes, still haven't. Yes, yeah, both the, the, the communication, what you are doing, the, like the overall evolution of your clientele with what you are doing, because you have been really pushing in a lot of direction. You know what? I think we've pushed our methods more than maybe our uh, marketing about it. Um, I think it's over maybe for three to the last five years as, as the consumer is, uh, is ready for it. Uh, we are also then talking about it a little bit more. Um, I think uh, because now going back to where we are and Roman mentioned that to, to before we have as a tasting room here in New York, there are some rules and regulation that works in our advantage having a farm license. We all have very active tasting rooms and we have active wine clubs. And uh, we then have a capture audience that we can actually take advantage of when we want to spearhead new ideas and so forth. So we have listeners, which is great. We also have access to the New York City market where you have sommeliers and, and, and savvy winos who are also listening. So we have that as an advantage to have a, a, a platform or a stage in order to see where, where this, um, yeah, take it, follow our adventures here, put it that way. I don't think yet we have done any math where I know we haven't, we've done the math, but we haven't, we haven't really seen what our efforts, additional cost, if that can translate into 
higher prices and so forth. So you see, uh, this are regular dry Riesling, which is under twenty dollars. About thirty percent of that fruit is then biodynamically farmed. Um, but I think we can start saying uh, Finger Lakes or New York is still a very value-driven region. It's a small, but I think we can push ourselves a little bit more and also be able to take advantage of that a little later. Uh, again, as I said, we do have a healthy wine club and also tasting rooms where we can tell our story and engage with the customers rather well. So that has, that has been an advantage for us doing all these things. And you, see, and you saw some uh, pretty good feedback on your, your evolution towards that organic and biodynamic through this yeah. people directly at the tasting room. People are receptive to the message. And, and very much so. They very yeah. much enjoy it. I mean, I, mean, I know, um, again, I know we have a, an, an international uh, crowd here. You know, US, uh, we represent maybe some of the worst tendencies, um, politics included, but also the best achievements here in, in the world. And we have a lot of people who wants to strive for better and better and better things. So we then we don't have so much regulations that we can actually jump in the deep end uh, with these things and, and people are listening and then we can create an audience for that. So, so yeah. Yes. We see see a lot of and yeah yeah and overall the the food and wine culture in the U.S. now has changed so much yeah I mean yeah. My, what an acceleration there has been here and I think, I think, I think it's, not, it's not even long until people demand this you know from us right so yeah there is definitely a, a change in conscience about where where it comes how it grows who grows it uh, and people are ready to 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 go for it now more than ever. But uh, thanks again a lot for that, uh, Oscar. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite amazing what's been accomplished uh, within, within you to cover within 15 years. So you really prove that there is this uh, entrepreneurship and spirit here in the US that things can change. And when you put things together, there is, there is a speed here of change that is quite amazing in America that sometimes it's struggling a little bit more when you are in, in more traditional area of the world, like Europe included. So. But thanks a lot. So, so now we're going to go on the other side of, of uh, Seneca with you, Josh. And um, yeah, so with Lamoureux. So uh, I, I, yes. I'm, I was very impressed by also like your personal perspective due pro to, your, to your history of how to address and how to improve sustainability uh, at Lamoureux, what you have been like in charge of. Uh, so can you talk us a little bit about the difference that you see on the two lakes and then really go into what you're being implementing, putting thinking uh, in a pretty large uh, structure, pretty large winery and how to you move towards sustainability there? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Roman and Oscar, for setting the stage um, for such an uh, important uh, subject and enthralling uh, discussion. So um, Oscar did a, a very... Uh, eloquent job of describing uh, the Finger Lakes and their importance, um, basically uh, sustaining life in the Finger Lakes. Uh, as far as the difference between the east side and the west side of the lake, um, you know, on the, the east side uh, is certainly different, um, just in any uh, glacially created um, area of agriculture, um, you know, there's going to be a resulting patchwork or quilt uh, of of soils that are laid down upon that last uh, glacial uh, recession. So um, that really establishes much of the framework and um, leads to a lot of the diversity, but there's many other factors. Um, so he talked about, um, you know, the mesoclimate um, on the east side of Seneca Lake, it's really divided into two um, very distinct areas. So from Lamoureux Landing there on the map down to the south end of the lake at Watkins Glen, uh, it's affectionately uh, called the banana belt. Um, so you're not going to find any bananas. It's all relative. Um, but the reference comes from the steeper aspect, um, western, all obviously western facing slopes, but very steep uh, aspect uh, of those slopes from Lamoureux down to the south end of the lake. Um, gets much, um, much less slope, much shallower, um, different topography as you move north to Geneva. Um, so it doesn't sound like much, but a few degrees a day 
um, on the west side. You know, we're going to get a couple more hours of that afternoon sun. Um, over a six-month growing season, that adds up. So we see about 15% more heat in our vineyards um, than, say, you'd have it at a vineyard, um, you know, up towards Geneva, even on our side of the lake. So um, that's significant. Um, we don't necessarily need the, the heat or the extra heat um, is, is not wanted for our aromatic whites. Um, but I feel uh, it does result in extra phenolics um, and we're able to do more uh, with skin and leaves contact and um, to really draw in um, the fruit and uh, expression of the vineyards. Um, so here at Lamar, we've been growing grapes since the 1940s. Um, so those would be La Brusca, um, your, your juice grapes, uh, vinifera since the 70s. Um, so we've got vines now that are uh, approaching 45 years old, Riesling, uh, Chardonnay, and Gewurz. And we've pretty much expanded since then. So 100% estate grown, estate bottled fruit. Um, we've been making wines here since 1990. So about 30 years of winemaking, kind of in in that second tier. Um, the state's around a thousand acres, uh, about 400 uh, hectares, um, 10 varietals um, that we have planted. It's near a contiguous two mile stretch along the east side in that banana belt. Um, it equates to about 120 acres under vine, which is, I guess, about 50 hectares. Um, really um, don't want to let that small footprint fool you. Again, think of that patchwork of, of soils. So um, you know, told you about the diversity of, of climates that exist from north to south, but even within our small footprint, um, it's, it's pretty impressive. Our 20 vineyard blocks uh, are planted in six different um, soil types, um, ranging from uh, those limestone uh, base uh, soils, sandstone and siltstone, um, and our round rock vineyard uh, is in a Lansing gravelly silt loam, which is more shale. Um, shale based. So uh, widely different um, growing conditions, effects on the vines, um, different elevation. So we, we, our lowest elevation is about 800 feet, about 240 meters above uh, sea level. And it goes up to about 1200 feet in our highest uh, elevations. Um, Oscar talked to you a lot about proximity to the lake. Uh, that drives um, more than anything, more than soil type, more than clone for us, what varietal, what clone of that varietal, uh, and, and what soil type, um, those will all fall in place when you evaluate um, a new planting and its proximity to the lake. So, um, you know, we have some that are as close as, uh, you know, 600 meters from the lake, and then some that are more than a mile. So it's widely different. Um, it's, it's just amazing. It's maddening almost, um, but that's what we signed up for. Um, and really the last thing is slope. So it can be, you know, 2% to 20% in some of our uh, steep, steepest terrace vineyards. So, um, Yeah, I, I think this is, this is a key point so that people understand that there is really the, the idea of this, this, this microclimate, this mic, micro plots is, is absolutely real. And as soon as you start to talk about sustainability is how to really adapt the type of farming to this, in fact, huge diversities that changed within a within couple of hundreds of meters. So how do you do that? How do you exactly put the tools for that? Boots on the ground. That's the only only way to do it. So there's there's obviously no recipe. There's no one size fits all. Um, we are all about balance of the vines. So that that old Cornell uh, program um, called Vine Balance. They they nailed it. At least with the marketing of their program. Um, we were one of the original 32 uh, wineries to complete that um, back when I got here in 2007. Um, I started in the vineyard and that was one of my first projects here was to go through that. Um, we found that we were already doing, um, you know, all, all of that and more. So I don't think you grow anything anywhere in the same spot for 80 years uh, and are able to keep doing it um, without stumbling uh, upon sustainability. So I'd, I'd like to, you know, beat my chest and, and tell you that we're, we know what we're doing. Um, but really, you know, life is the best uh, educator and mother nature is cruel, cruel 
uh, uh, force. Um, so it's, it's been an arduous journey, I think, here at Lamoureux, but definitely one that's been very fulfilling. Um, you know, we were already dry farming. Uh, we had eliminated pesticides and herbicides. We were experimenting with cover crops. Um, I don't think that sustainable, you know, sustainability or certification is going to change anything philosophically, really, um, about what we've been doing. It's more taking credit for it and maybe more on the marketing side that you were uh, alluding to um, earlier. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, because I think as people get more educated about it, um, and um, certainly younger generations um, learning about it and, and getting invested and realizing that we are living off the land. And if we screw that up, um, we're, we're not gonna have um, anything uh, to move forward with. And that's you know very important. And then we can get into those discussions of, you know, why does this vine respond differently in this soil versus this soil or in this slope? Um, you know, there's, there's no one size fits all. The vines, um, they tell you when they're not happy. So if you're out there walking, um, I can tell immediately, um, symptomatically in the vines, um, you know, color difference, growth patterns. Um, you know, we're out there, um, looking, um, you know, when, when it comes time for harvest sampling, um, you know, you can taste the difference, you can see the difference. Uh, you, you can um, certainly, um, if you're listening, uh, you can do the right thing. And if you care of vines and have balanced vines, uh, then you're more apt to have very balanced uh, expressive fruit. And as we all know, uh, it only goes downhill from there. So if you don't start with uh, that premium fruit, um, you're never going to achieve that, that highest uh, quality wine. So, um, but I think one of the, the other, go ahead. No, no, I wanted on that note to, uh, to, to talk about the, the technical and technological initiative you put in place and you are working with, which, because I never heard about some of the thing you are, you've been doing before. And I found that this, idea that uh, we, we see a lot of going back to nature and being hands off and, you know, kind of not doing anything. But at the same time, there is really a use of technology today that can be very, very positive of research and science uh, can be positive to continue to improve uh, all this, uh, this care, this care for both uh, the land and also the people working in the land. Can you touch on that? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, you, you call it positive continuous improvement. My staff calls it nerdy obsession with numbers and uh, technology. So um, yeah, we're, we're not ever to rest uh, on our, our laurels or um, to, to really think that we know everything. Um, you know, we've, we work very closely with Cornell as, as um, everyone who wants to improve does up here. Um, so, you know, everything we do in the vineyard and the wine cellar is evaluated through the prism of wine quality. Um, so, you know, we work with the uh, Cornell professors and graduate students. Um, you know, we've made huge changes uh, since 2007. So um, you can kind of see the vines here. So we are 100% solar powered, uh, but we look at the, our vineyards as solar collectors. So we, um, in conjunction with research done in our vineyards by Cornell, um, converted 100% over to Scott Henry trellis system, uh, which is a vertically split um, trellis. Uh, it opens up the fruiting zone, as, as Roman showed you uh, with the VSP that he's using down there. It's, it's accomplishing the same effect. Uh, it's uh, sun on the fruit, air movement through the trellis, um, you know, min minimizing uh, the, uh, the wetness time and thus, thus your exposure to fungicides, um, so, or uh, fungus, which you have to spray fungicides for. So we've already reduced our spray program by about 40% uh, using uh, this change to the trellis system. Um, really the next thing that I'm looking at um, is, well, geez, we've got rid of pesticides and we've got rid of herbicides. Um, how are we gonna get rid of fungicides? Um, so there's been, uh, quite a lot of research done now on powdery mildew, which is what eats us alive. You know, the lake is a double-edged sword. Um, Oscar told you, you know, it's going to keep us alive, uh, keep the vines alive, um, but it, it can do some, um, some damage to your fruit if you have a powdery 
or downy mildew outbreak. Um, but uh, they've proven in raspberries, cucumbers, many other uh, commercial crops that um, powdery mildew is, um, has a very robust mechanism for repairing its DNA, uh, but it only operates during the day. So it's kind of evolved to protect itself against sunlight, against the natural UV rays. Um, but it shuts that DNA repair mechanism down at night. So if you expose uh, the mildew to uh, the right wavelengths and right intensities of light at night, um, it fries them and it, it 100%. Um, and it also has some ancillary uh, effects on downy mildew as well. So very encouraging research. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of signed up. Um, it's in conjunction with uh, um, not only a professor at Cornell, uh, but also a uh, robotics company that's based out of Norway and that also operates in the UK and the US. Um, but um, autonomous robots with UV lights uh, operating at night kind of sounds a little space age. It's definitely not, um, you know, not necessarily a romantic um, story that uh, everyone wants to hear. Um, but if it could, you know, ultimately prevent us from having to spray those synthetic fungicides and which is what's keeping us from going, you know, fully organic uh, here at Lamoureux, um, I'm, I'm all ears. I'm willing to give them, you know, rows, acres of fruit um, to experiment on. So our biggest challenge for this year is getting, uh, getting the equipment and the operators uh, into the country in the, in the current state of uh, the pandemic. So if it doesn't go forward this year, um, hopefully in the near future, we'll be, um, we'll be getting some real data from our vineyards and um, certainly learning from it, whether we can implement it or not on the entire state. Uh, thanks, thanks, Roger, for that. Uh, I, I think that's um, that's a fascinating project. I never heard of that before, um, especially for certain sort of large scale winery, and that can be definitely something that can be can definitely. I will look for the results. Um, can you talk a little bit about about the, this wine, and then uh, for the sake of time, there is a couple of questions. Uh, I will address to one of each of you uh, just to, to follow up a little bit the conversation. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, quickly on, on the wine. So we do, you know, those 20 different vineyard blocks, so 10 different varietals, um, you know, ranging from uh, single vineyard Rieslings to uh, Method Champenois sparkling ice wine. Um, I've got a Cab Franc here that um, we're featuring today. Um, this is our T23 on Oak Cab Franc. So T23 stands for Tank 23. Uh, it's the purest expression of Cab Franc that we can put in the bottle. Um, Cab Franc is, is really where it's at on the red side for, um, at least for us here at Lamoureux. Um, just so expressive, like Riesling of where it's grown, the soil, um, how it's treated. Um, this wine is a direct result of, of that, um, that Scott Henry trellis system, getting the sun on these berries early, getting those methoxypyrazines uh, completely metabolized and, and they're, they're gone and really tapping into um, the pure expression of the fruit. Um, this is a, a, almost a semi-carbonic maceration mm -hmm. technique where we're um, doing a whole berry fermentation. Um, we're not adding any CO2, but it's a, you know, a kind of a closed vat, vat fermentation, a little bit of um, you know, yeast, a little bit of intercellular uh, fermentation um, and it's getting pressed off early. So we're getting um, a good bit of extraction, but pressing it off at about two thirds uh, sugar depletion, mm -hmm. preserving the acidity, uh, that food friendly nature. So um, for us, this is, this is uh, pure Lamoureux. No, I think it's a, it's a great because it's not, uh, you don't get any kind of the traditional or so um, carbonic aromatics. It's not too amylic or anything. And then it, you, you pick up still the kind of more um, fruity side, full side of the, of the Cabernet Franc. You don't denature the varietal either. So no, no, it's a, it's, it's a strong wine. That's, uh, but that's also for me, surely Cabernet Franc is such a complicated grape variety to grow well without getting into certain aromatics that can be of putting that this is for me, one of the biggest, evolution of quality is a red Bordeaux-based grape, but Cabernet Franc especially in, in the state has been fantastic. I and I think it's definitely linked to farming on both sides. We too. like, that's for me a, a big one uh, in terms of evolution of quality. Uh, 
But I, I, thanks, thanks for, for all that. I think it's very interesting to see all your different approaches, which I think matters uh, in, in the fact that there is a sense of terroir. I don't think terroir is a word we should use just in the old world. There is every place has its own, uh, own specificity and you are tackling it according to the specific for your place, your team, and also the structure of your winery. And I think this is also part of that idea of sustainability and pushing in different direction that today are super dynamic as a whole. So um, just we got just three questions that I'm going to address to uh, each of you. Uh, first one will be for Roman. There is a question, larger question about water management uh, and how is this is handled today. Uh, uh, I think in terms of uh, the water conservation, uh, using water pro and also water waste. Uh, this is something you really pay attention to and how so and how you've been doing that in Long Island. If we can do that, just I'm sorry, short, just to keep, yeah, I know people have, may have to go after that. So I just, uh, at, this stage, point. at this stage, I think there's only two, two wineries who have water treatment facilities in their winery. Mm -hmm. um, there is no, you know, no regulations as of such, and most wineries are quite small. Um, you know, now people, well, in general, you don't use chlorine anymore in wineries, and, and you really have eliminated most of the chemicals that one uses now, other than maybe an alkaline once a year, mm -hmm. and the acidity that you would deal with if, when you have lees or something. But uh, there's no, there's only two wineries. It will come more, I think, you know, over the next 10, 20 years, there will definitely be more restrictions, which will then lead to you know, more water treatment management. So despite the fact that we're in an environment that rain is not an issue here, we don't have the drought is not an issue like other part of the world. There is already specific thinking that have been put in place to both water waste and water use, right? And yep. something that is going to be no water shortages so far on you know in new york state but, but it doesn't mean that but it doesn't matter in the meantime you still you know again it, you, you live here it depends what you use how big you become uh, there will be ultimately regulations that you will have to do water treatments anything on your side on that subject oscar josh that you want to add about that water issue um no i mean it's the same small small wineries uh, not much of you water usage again we have the opposite challenge we have almost too much water here um uh, so we are looking at uh, so there's no irrigation i got a question here i think from fred about it there's no irrigation or anything like that i think what we're working towards is here in the finger lakes i know in long island is uh runoff you know keeping the, there's initiatives to keep the lakes clean and so forth so that's something that the wineries are, are working on with cover crop and so forth. So, but uh, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, there is a larger issue with the finger lakes, especially like both of you are working towards water bodies and water pollution is a big, big question today, as, as we know. So, yeah, the vineyards are very small polluters when it comes to herbicides or, or fertilizer. Um, I think that all the private residences where we live here and everybody uses their one, two, three Scott. Uh, you know, grass, most of the perfect Hampton grass meadow, I think that's a much bigger polluter than, than any of the wineries. Oh, it's, a, it's a good part. I think it's a way to put stuff in perspective too, and that's a good one. So, um, Oscar, some, uh, what you're going to do with, uh, with, um, with your new property? What the, oh, what that's the right. Well, for, okay, yeah, that was a question about, yes, yeah, so we took over standing, standing stone. stone in terms yeah, of conversion. We, yeah, so uh, we took over standing stone now three years ago. Um, and that uh, was about 50 acres on the east side. Similar circumstances as Lamero Landing, hair slopes, uh, then facing west. Um, again, on pretty some pretty steeper slopes. Uh, we are some heavy initiatives there are changing things around. It was a conventionally farmed property before. So we stopped uh, again, immediately stopped using herbicides and then gradually going towards this year will be the first year we are going to initiate the biodynamic uh, input. If it's um, silicas, the 501 sprays or, or uh, teas and so forth. Um, we've mainly worked on soils, soils getting uh, revitalizing soils, getting uh, soil structure, soil health back 
uh, also focusing on um, the root systems of the vine um, in order so they don't rely on anything that comes from the top of the surface. So uh, a lot of cover crop, uh, some ripping, and uh, uh, some quite a lot of organic manure has gone down there. But because of that site is isolated from any other sites, there's a there's a state forest north of it, and uh, and also uh, forests around, and also our neighbor Lamoureux is neighbor, so there are, there are good, well managed vineyard around us. We are able to to be able to probably go into some biodynamic uh, initiatives there too. So. In that sense, it's good to have neighbors. Otherwise, that could be a problem when you have uh, different kinds of initiatives. So we look forward to that. It's old vines, standing stone, are vines from the early 70s, one of the first vineyards here in the vineyard. So we'll see That's how exciting. they handle the transition. That's exciting. That's very exciting to see that. Yeah. And uh, maybe like the last question for you, Josh, it was a question more about, uh, about uh, wine making uh, and overall, um, and I'm going to get it a bit broader, but the change of, of practices in a vineyard, does it allow you to be more hands-off in a winemaking uh, in terms of using any kind of, um, of, of potential additives? Do you see that this quality of the grapes help you not to, because the question was more about acidity, but acidity is not really an issue. In, Never. In, no. in, in your no. area, yeah. right? For days, and yeah. if you don't embrace that in the Finger Lakes or anywhere in New York, um, you should probably uh, go grow grapes somewhere else like California or Australia. Um, acidity, yeah, or deacidification or acidification, uh, don't know anything about it. But uh, certainly clean fruit, expressive fruit. Our biggest uh, thing that we focus on is keeping the lots separate. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as big as the vineyards are and as many blocks, um, it's keeping uh, the varietal uh, clonal soil combinations intact in the cellar mm -hmm. for as long as possible. So bringing small quantities of fruit in um, that are, um, you know, very uh, expressive of that individual site and, uh, you know, vinifying them and having those tools or those colors kind of on our artist's palette um, to, um, you know, make our wines later on down the road. If you don't separate that up front, you can never get it back. Um, so that's key for us is terroir, expression of terroir, capturing that in the cellar and having as many options open for making the best wines possible um, down the road. But it's very minimal intervention. Uh, a lot of uh, indigenous spontaneous fermentations. Um, it's all... Uh, cross flow filtration. So very low pressure on um, tangential um, filtration, very soft, not a lot of waste, any waste streams with, you know, additives and fining and filtering agents and, you know, pads that you're going through. Um, so that's, that's all very unsustainable. Um, so it's, um, it's definitely worth um, the extra effort and extra planning. Yeah, I think there's a funny to, to say that overall more balance in the vineyard and more more quality grapes, the less you can do in a winery with the control they need to do. It's in your tail otherwise. If you're you know getting greedy in the vineyard and you want 26 bricks, um, you may have four grams of acid and then you're adding acid, but then your pH is out of whack. So then you're adding something else to fix that. And, and meanwhile, you've got to add a fining agent to take out you know, whatever characteristic you added with the five other chemicals and you're left with nothing. You're, you know, nothing that resembled um, that beautiful fruit that you had in the vineyard or could have had um, if you'd put your effort out there. So that's, um, that's pretty, pretty simple in our minds, but that's, that's the philosophy. Yeah, that's something simple that needs to be reiterated, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Um, and I have just a one like, and it's going to probably going to be more for Sam. Um, there is a question about um, the, um, the carbon footprint, which seems to be like uh, some of uh, 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 some of the focus of certain other area of one regional world to go carbon footprint zero. Uh, what is a, what is a, like with a new sustainable program put in place? Uh, is it something that's going to be big on it? That carbon footprint uh, parameter. 
Yeah, so I dropped into the Q&A uh, some info about the CLCPA uh, law that was passed by New York State in 2019. And I, I can't say specifically how we're going to address it, but it, it's, it's an initiative by the state that we do take into account um, carbon impacts. And there's been some research done in Australia about the potential for vines to do carbon sequestration. Um, but I think the the more immediate way we can address, address this is via the uh, farm equipment. So I know uh, recently in Sonoma, there was the um, testing of a all electric um, uh, tractor. Uh, so I think those are ways that we can reduce carbon footprint on the farm. I know some folks use um, uh, the wind turbines to help manage the uh, temperature level in the vineyard, especially when it gets cold at night. And those oftentimes run on natural gas or on some other type of fuel. So that's, you know, an, another area where that can be reduced. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the example of Josh and what his, his winery has done with becoming 100% solar is, is another way that wineries can make some immediate investments to address their carbon footprint. I don't know if Oscar, if you've done anything in, in your winery, but I know, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of wineries that have switched over to, you know, solar panels. There's a lot of incentives from the state to do that. Yeah, just to add to that, we have a few buildings here now with also geothermal and so forth. But, but just to add a little bit to your question, but also with Sam, you will see us now in New York, uh, most wineries are, are rather progressive in this and we are really going at it and because we can take all these initiatives you will see also uh, agility in the sustainable program and you will see the wineries might be pushing the envelope more than, than the state and the regulations actually so again going back to what the customer demands but also what we want to do because it's it's common sense so you are seeing i think you will see a lot of lot of lot of um, again, good initiatives coming. We've already been there, but just, yep, just overall positive things, I think. Uh, well, thanks a lot for, I think, uh, we went through uh, all the, all the questions. Um, I would just add a quick one, uh, and going to be the last one, um, just about urbanization and tourism as a threat. Maybe not urbanization in, is a more question before Long Island, where definitely, uh, but uh, tourism is not really a threat, is a positive thing. Is it a, a question from a, from a. Um, yeah, probably Jerry. from Long Island, not up here. Yeah. <laughs> in the <thing> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Roman can't answer for, for the Hamptons, but it's definitely a crowded area in the Hamptons, but there is also a lot of initiative to protect the land over there. That's, there is a conscious from, from, from the county and from different associations about what can be uh, sold as constructible area versus protecting the farming side of, uh, of, of, of Long Island. So definitely a, a, a conscious that needs to be protected. So, but I wanted to thank well, you we, a lot. We, well, yeah, just please, one, we have a, a thing in New York State called Ag, Ag Districts Laws that um, they're, they're designated at the county level. And so that provides a state level of uh, zoning protections to farms that they're allowed to, they have a right to farm. Um, you know, they're protected from certain nuisance complaints from their neighbors. So, you know, there, there are um, protections in place for farms. Um, I guess I, not to open this box, but I do, I think, at least in the Finger Lakes, there's a certain level of competition between vacation homes and quality agricultural land that could otherwise be being put to you know, vineyard use or other of uh, the uh, specialty crops that are grown in the Finger Lakes. Thanks a lot for this precision. Uh, and it's great to see that there is this initiative done uh, to understand that it needs to be preserved. Uh, yeah. So, but I uh, wanted to thank you. Um, and uh, it's, it's very stimulating and exciting to see what's happening. And uh, for, the, for, the, for the years to come, uh, I think it's going to continue to really improve uh, uh, I think there's a reputation also of the region as being that forward thinking dynamic uh, together region. It's, it's something very, very strong. And I think uh, is, is a way in the path to, to the future uh, for, for quality wine international recognition. So um, thanks a lot for that. I uh, was very happy to talk with you, Sam, uh, Josh, Oscar, Roman. 
Thank you. Thank you all. Um, uh, yes, as Pascaline said, uh, there will be a recording of today's webinar uh, published to the YouTube channel uh, for New York Wine and Grape Foundation. And we'll send out that link in an email in the next couple of days. Um, and then also just to say that, you know, the series will continue. And um, so next month on March 17th, uh, Felicity Carter will return as our moderator to host uh, Boldly Global, where we look at New York uh, on the world stage, kind of comparing and contrasting uh, with other classic wine regions of the world. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, thank you, Pascaline, and to our panelists, Sam, uh, and to all of our attendees. Hope you have a safe and enjoyable week.